And good evening, church. God bless you for attending tonight. Here we are for another study. We're in the book of 1 Thessalonians this evening. If you want to get your Bibles out, I praise God for the opportunity. I know that I say that every time, how great it is that we can gather to learn God's Word together, but it really is a privilege, and I'm really happy you're here. Thank you again uh, for leaving a, a like or a share. Uh, for subscribing to the channel, to, to just helping promote the Word of God in the in the internet world as your click sends the, the message all over the world, really. So, thank you again. Most of all, though, I pray that tonight you and I can grow as followers of Jesus Christ. And as we begin, I want to pray for us. Let's pray. Father God, we bow before you. We ask you for power. We ask you for understanding. We ask you to open our eyes to see the truth of your word. Whether that's for the person that's never met Jesus, that will come to you by faith, God, please open their hearts to see you as the Christ, the lover of our souls. Or if it's those who follow you every day, Lord, that we might develop as disciples to be the people you call us to be and understand the truth. I pray in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen and amen. Now, before we get too far tonight, I just want to talk to you for a minute. You know, we in modern Christianity, whatever that is, we've come to this idea that you have professional religious people, like pastors, and if you're in Catholicism, like priests. We have people that they, they're supposed to sort of have the red phone to God, right? They've gone to seminary, maybe, many of them. Uh, they have understanding in various passages, understanding about doctrine. Uh, they're the ones that are supposed to um, move the church forward, move us all into a better understanding. I just want you to understand that although the, the Bible will clearly declare that God appoints people as pastors to shepherd his flock, most of the requirements of the pastor are requirements of every Christian. We're all supposed to follow God and be faithful. We're all supposed to be his witnesses. We're all supposed to make disciples. We're all supposed to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We're all supposed to uh, pray continuously. I mean, many, 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 in fact, most of the things that pastors are called to do, uh, the whole body of Christ is called to do. So when we read this a passage tonight about the Apostle Paul and how he cares for the Thessalonians. I want you to think about something. We could just peg this to the professionals. Oh, if you've been to seminary, if you are ordained, if you're the pastor of a church, this applies to you. But I think more wisdom can be found in the idea that this approach to ministry applies to every one of us as you witness to your friends or your co-workers or your classmates or just the guy in line at the grocery store who whoever god brings into your life that you feel this is this is the one i'm supposed to talk to whenever that happens uh, i just want you to think about how paul approaches people from the heart and understand that you and I are called in the same way to model that sort of attitude as we pursue the Lord by obeying him when he tells us to make disciples and be witnesses. You know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of postings in, in social media these days that say things like, um, well, if that person is uh, bringing you down, get rid of them. If that person is a negative influence in your life, your best bet is to just get rid of them. I want you to see from God's perspective how we're to approach the stranger, the unbeliever, the brother and sister in Christ. What should our attitude be? Praise God that God didn't get rid of me when I was um, not very nice to be around. Praise God that God didn't get rid of you when you were in active rebellion against him. No, God has a place in his heart for us. He sent his son to die for us. And we're going to see that demonstrated tonight in Paul's approach as he talks to the Thessalonians about what ministry is really like and what it's really about. And so let's get to it tonight. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we were here last week, but just by way of review, Paul starts to list his credentials about why he has the authority and the right to talk to this body. He says, look, we're not appealing from um, uh, our own selves. We're not, we're not appealing from error. We're, we're not among you as impure people who are in this for ourselves. We are not coming to you to deceive you. And as you think about how we are to approach people, this is very instructive right from jump here tonight. Just think about this. We're not trying to communicate error. We're not trying to help people understand something about God so that we can take advantage of them. We're not trying to be impure before them. Our life is to be a model of, of Christian character, of obedience to God. We're not trying to deceive people. This is critically important. You know, many people are in religion for their own gain. You can read about the false teachers all through Scripture, the shepherds that drop the ball. They're not walking in Christ. They're not doing what they're called to do. They're satisfying their urge for money. They're satisfying their urge for sex. They're satisfying their urge for popularity all through the people of God, taking advantage of them like a wolf among the sheep. Paul says, look, that's not the attitude we have. That's not where ministry is found. We're, we're not appealing to you on that ground. Then he moves on, remember, but just as we have been approved by God, understand what he's saying. God has saved us. God has given us the ministry. God has saved you if you've come to Jesus Christ by faith. God has given you a purpose, a ministry, a calling that you are to work out as you follow him, right? Well, Paul says, look, we're approved by God. In other words, we know Jesus. We've been forgiven. God has endorsed this ministry. He's put us forward as his agents, all right? In fact, it says here what? He's entrusted us with the gospel. This applies to you. It applies to me. It applies the apostle, to the apostle Paul. If we're walking by faith in Jesus Christ, God has drawn us to himself. He's made us a part of his family. He's adopted us, and he's asked us to follow him. All right. He's approved us. We're, we're in his kingdom. Okay. What has he given us? He's given us his message, the truth of salvation. Right here, just like Paul, we've been entrusted with the gospel. We are here to help people understand that Jesus is the Christ. We help them by modeling our love for Christ in our behavior, in our thoughts, in our words, and we help them by actually speaking the truth of God in love to them. We preach the gospel to them. That's the point, all right? That's the point right here. Paul is in that process, just like you and I are called to that process. So we speak not to please men. Now that's really important, right? We're not going to let the popularity of our culture dictate the message, all right? God's approved us. God has given us the gospel. We're not here to tell you our opinion. We're not here to tell you what we uh, consider to be most important. We're here to tell you what God says. If you're going to be somebody that cares for others and fulfills your calling before God, you've got to understand that. You're not there to tell them, tell somebody else what you think is important. You and I are here to tell other people how God has impacted our life through his truth and through the reality that Jesus is the Christ. We are here to speak the truth, his truth, not ours. We speak not to please man. So in other words, I'm not, a, I'm not worried about whether I'm going to offend you or not. I'm worried about whether I'm speaking the truth as God has revealed it. Our job isn't to please people. Instead, what does he say here? Our job is to please God, to please God. That's what we're here to do. And God says, you know, he's going to test us. He's going to bring us into situations that might be difficult. But that nonetheless is, is our calling. All right. Paul says, look, I never came to you with words of flattery. My, my goal in knowing you wasn't to build you up like, oh, you're just the greatest. You're just the best one ever. And we're just, I mean, you know, flattery, flattery, flattery. No, I'm not trying to manipulate you is basically what he's saying here. I'm not trying to appeal to your sense of you want to hear what you want to hear and it, and it should be good when you're talking about yourself. No, I'm not trying to flatter you. Again, I'm trying to tell you the truth. 
again, you and I, as we follow Christ and as we minister to others, we need to pay close attention to this. Are we just trying to gain popularity and have people like us? And so we butter somebody else up so that they'll think we're great? No, that's not it. We need to be loving, we need to be kind, we need to care, but we're not going to manipulate people through flattery. As you know, nor with a pretext for greed. Again, here it is. The, the second way to really mess up here is to be a religious person for gain, for money. God is our witness. Paul says, look, I'm not all about the money. I'm not all about trying to manipulate you to like me. No, I'm about speaking God's truth to you in love. God is my witness. He sees what we're doing. He understands, and he's endorsed us. He's affirmed us. He's approved us. We're doing what we're supposed to do. He says, look, I didn't seek glory from people. I'm not in this so that you'll like me. This is a critical thing for us. You and I, as we approach people in life, to help them understand how God has impacted our life through the truth that Jesus is the Christ, and to help them as we care for them and, and supply their need if we're able, uh, we're not trying to get them to say, hey, you're just the greatest, you know, we're, we're so happy about you. No, we live our lives to glorify God, to bring praise to Him, not to ourselves. All right, so Paul is saying the same thing here. He says, look, uh, we're not after glory from you, uh, whether from you or from others, doesn't matter. And, and here's a really critical thing in the letter to the Thessalonians. Paul says, look, we could have made demands. <laughs> we have the spiritual authority and the spiritual right to ask you things, to ask that you do things for us, to make demands of you. But we didn't do that. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to communicate the gospel in love, in truth. Now, Paul now takes us to a place that's just profound. And I'm, I hope I can explain it well to you. Look at this. But we were gentle among you. We were gentle among you. How gentle, you ask? Well, here it is. Like a nursing mother. Okay, now, <laughs> we just had a couple in our church give birth to a little baby girl. She's a beautiful little baby, and I've been to their house a couple times since uh, she came. And what's so fascinating is just to watch that family care for that baby, specifically the mom. The mom is attentive to every whimper. The mom is ready to spring into action at any moment if there's any distress at all. I mean, the mom is gentle, loving, caring. She has developed, I think they call it bonding. She's developed a bond with this child. She's never spoken with this child. The child's never said anything back to her. No, it's just that that child is her baby. And she's going to care for that baby with every bit of emotion, love, tenderness, gentleness available to her. Paul uses that analogy to say, look, that's how I love you. I mean, if you look at the love of a mother, you have to remember, right, that the mother's love doesn't end when the baby grows up. No. In fact, how many, how many mothers have seen their child make big mistakes in their later years, and the mother says, oh, but, you know, he's, he's really a good boy at heart. I, I don't know. I mean, they can't hardly accept that their child might have done something wrong. All right, that they're so supportive, so willing to love no matter what. Paul says, look, I, I love you guys like that. You and I need to think about these modern slogans where if somebody's not nice, you should just get rid of them. Um, understand the heart of ministry. Understand that you and I are called to love people like we love ourselves, right? We're called to be people that will care, even if the person that we're caring for is not lovely or not responding to us in the way that we wanted them to. We're still called by God to love them. They were made, created by God in the image of God. They have souls. God is 
doing everything in his power to bring them to the reality that Jesus is the Christ and save their souls through faith in Christ. And you and I, as participants with God in that ministry, are to care for them like a parent, like a mom. He says, look, I was gentle with you guys. Uh, imagine Paul's walking into a pagan town full of pagan gods, full of pagan people that don't know anything about Jesus Christ, and he's going in and telling them, look, all your paganism is wrong. You need to come to Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. You need to yield your life to him. Does he do that with a heavy hand? Does he do that with a or else? No, he does that with gentleness. He does that with love. He does that with that opportunity in his heart to say, you matter to God and that's why you matter to me and let me be gentle. He, he cares for them like a nursing mother who's taking care of her own children. Now, think about ministry through this lens, church. Who do you know in your life that you know they're looking to you for what it means to be a Christian, or you've had opportunity to speak to them or to serve them as you serve Christ? Can you honestly say that you love them, that you love them like a mother would take care of her own baby, that your affection for them is, is overwhelming? This is a great example for us. Paul is saying, I care for you. Even if you're all messed up, even if you're going the wrong direction, my heart for you burns. I, I can't get you out of my mind. It's not, it's not just that I have the role of pastor, so I get to tell you what to do, and you have to do it or forget you. I mean, have you ever met an authoritative kind of pastor like that that will just get rid of you at a heartbeat if you don't do what he wants? <laughs> There's plenty out there, but not Paul. Paul's saying, look, I, I love you with the affection a mom has for her kids. We need to think about that when we think about how to minister to other people and how to reach other people. There has to be love in there, right? Think about this, Isaiah 66. This is God. He says, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. God even uses the illustration in the Old Testament of himself as a mother who loves and comforts his children. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 23. Do you remember? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Look at this. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, look, <laughs> I love you with a passion. Uh, it's not casual to me. I am overwhelmed in my heart with affection for you. Now, in his case, he's talking about the nation of Israel, and they're ready to reject him, in fact, even to crucify him. But in the midst of that, what does he say? You know, have you ever seen a hen gather her chicks? This is the similar illustration of, the, of a mother's care. I love you affectionately, and I want to take care of you. But in this verse, Jesus says, but you guys don't want anything to do with me. You won't come to me. Well, that's a whole other sermon. In the end, I want you to just see that right here, Jesus even demonstrates the care of a mother for his people, even though he's been rejected resoundly by them. And so Paul kind of explains this. He says, look, I'm affectionately desirous of you. <laughs> I, I have love in my heart for you. I mean, how many times can he say it? He's telling them, I am not casually involved. I am not the hit and run preacher that's going to come in, deliver the news, and take off to try to make money at the next place. No. I am truly concerned for your well-being, your spiritual growth, your relationship with Christ, your development. That's what I want. When you minister to people in your life, do you love them like that? Are you affectionately desirous of their growth? He says, look, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God. Okay, we give you the truth as God has revealed it, 
but also we're ready to share ourselves with you. You have our lives. <laughs> I heard a guy come come into my uh, kitchen the other day. We were having a conversation, and the guy says, "Hey, being a pastor is the worst job ever." And there was like this resounding yes around the table. Yeah, this is so hard. Blah, blah, blah. You'll never survive as a minister, whether you're a formal pastor of a church or whether you're ministering in your life to the people around you, your family members, your co-workers, your classmates, whoever's in your life, as you minister the gospel. You'll never survive if you pin, pin your hopes on their reactions, and on their uh, acceptance or rejection. No, no. You've, you've got to pin your hopes on God. You, you share the gospel of God, and then you share yourself. You have to become vulnerable. You have to say to somebody, yeah, I will go the extra mile. Yeah, I will demonstrate the love of Christ to you. God got on a cross to demonstrate his love for me. Oh, you know, sure, I can come help you with this or that. Sure, I can offer myself to you. Paul is saying, look, I offered you myself. We all did. Because you had become what? because you had become very dear to us. Do you see just how this oozes with affection? This oozes with love and care. And again, it's illustrating how a mother treats her child. She's affectionately desirous. In fact, this lady I was just telling you about that just had a baby, she was so overwhelmed with the love she felt. She had never felt that kind of connection with any person before. She was just taken aback. She cried for a couple weeks. She felt so bonded and connected. Paul's describing that very thing right here. Look, I'm sharing the truth with you, but I'm also sharing my very life. You and I have to get involved. This thing in ministry in current times that says, oh, you know, my life is about I order what I want uh, to eat from, you know, one of those services that will bring it to my door. And then I order what I need in my uh, life from Amazon or one, you know, Walmart, someplace. They drive it right to me. Uh, I go to church online. Uh, you know, I might text a few people, but, you know, I kind of like this isolated, don't let anybody bother me life. It's kind of nice to be in my little cocoon and live my life by myself with a few friends out there if I want to. This is not the role of ministry. This is not how God describes ministry. You and I, look at the example of Apostle, the Apostle Paul. He's giving them himself. Spend time with the people that God has brought to you to bring them to the realization that Jesus is the Christ. Spend time to love them as you love yourself with an affection, with a desire for their well-being. This is what Paul demonstrates to us. So critical. Now, look at verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. Our labor and toil. Again, what did we just talk about? How you have to get involved? What's Paul saying here? I was involved. I was all in. Uh, we worked night and day. In other words, when you wanted to meet, I met with you. When you wanted to hear more, I talked more. When you wanted to cry together, I was there for you. When you wanted to laugh, I we laughed with you. We worked all the time to make sure you understood what the message of the gospel is. We worked physically as well. Do you see this next line that we might not be a burden to any of you? We weren't in this for the money. Paul's a tent maker, right? We learned that in the book of Acts. Paul knows how to work with his hands. Paul makes income on the side so that he doesn't have to charge the churches for his upkeep. Well, Paul's saying, look, I worked all the time. I was there with you. I was off making money in the wee hours of the night trying to survive financially while I ministered to you. I didn't want to be a burden to any of you. While we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. We were in your midst to do what we were supposed to do, but instead of charging you for our efforts, we did it for free for you. We spent more hours working with our hands. 
We were not a burden to you. We still fulfilled our mission. By God's grace, we told you about Jesus. How far is this verse from modern times where we have people fleecing the flock? I mean, we have people that call themselves godly ministers, multimillionaires, making bank off of their people and trying to make more and more. Now, God can prosper us, sure, but how many millions do you need before you've gone across the line? I mean, really, this is not the attitude of Paul. He's not trying to get rich. He's just saying, look, I'm going to do what I have to do to survive so that I don't burden you because I don't want you to think I'm here to, to take your money. I'm here for you to respond to the gospel. Is that your attitude when you deal with the people in your life? You are witnesses. I love that, right? Paul is saying what? He's saying, look, you guys know this. You were there. You were there when we were there. You watched what we did. You're witnesses. And so is God. You see this? God's also a witness. He understands our hearts. He knows we're motivated correctly. He knows we're telling his truth and not our own. We're not trying to be impure among you. We're not trying to sleep with the people in the congregation. We're not trying to uh, take advantage of you in any way. We're not going to deceive you. Okay, God sees it all. And he, he now brings us to a great point. He says, look, you guys saw this. God saw it too, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Now, this is a great verse for you and me. As we deal with people in our lives, what do we have to focus ourselves on? Are we living in integrity? Are we living in a way that honors God and, and displays the moral life that God would have us have? Look, he says, look, we were holy among you. We were separated for God. We were not taking part in any kind of pagan rituals. We were not taking part in any sort of debauchery that would call our character into question. No, we were faithful to the word of God when we were with you. We were righteous. We lived the way God calls us to live so that you could not call us hypocrites, so that you could not look at us and say, I'm going to reject the message of Jesus Christ because I see that you don't even do what Jesus says. You, you live your life the way you want to live it, and you tell me I have to follow Jesus. No, that doesn't work, right? He says, look, we were holy. We were righteous. We were blameless. You look at our conduct among you. We never took advantage of you. We never deceived you. We were never impure among you. We kept God's holy law. We, not that law saves anybody, but when God says don't steal, we didn't steal. When God says don't lie, we didn't lie. We walked in the power of the Spirit. We worked in a way that honored God. Now, we have to step back. Maybe you're in your life and you're saying, well, you know, my ministry among the people I work with is really ineffective. I've never led anybody to Christ. Nobody ever asked me about what it's like to know Jesus or, or to follow God. Maybe I need to step back from that and say, well, am I living in a way that would demonstrate, that would show somebody what it's like to follow the living God? Or am I living like everybody else, doing everything they do? I want to do it too. Are, are you basically short-circuiting any power God might display through your life because of the way you live? It's a question we all need to grapple with because it can short-circuit ministry just like that. What's happening in Paul's example? Hey, I don't have that problem. I don't have a double life. I'm not living one way in front of you and another way somewhere else. Uh, I'm not sowing my wild oats on Saturday night and coming to church on Sunday morning to pray for crop failure. No, that's not my life. He says what? I'm holy. I'm righteous. I'm blameless. I am bringing you the unadulterated, purely motivated truth of God's word. And I am so affectionate towards you. I care so much that you will receive it, that you will believe, that you will be born again and experience the new life that's available through faith in Jesus Christ. He says, look, my conduct's really important. 
I, I want to live well because I don't want anybody to have the argument against me that I don't have to believe in that because you're just a hypocrite. In fact, isn't this the claim made by many, many unbelievers in the world? I'm not going to church. I'm not following Jesus. Those people are just a bunch of hypocrites. And, sad to say, that's a well-deserved criticism by many circumstances. I mean, many people have claimed all these things and then fallen away. Well, God is still faithful. God is still true. And if you're willing to be his minister and lay your life down before him, whether you're formally a minister like a pastor of a church or you're the minister God has placed in the lives of your co-workers and your family, well, here's the, here's the moral code. We live well so that the message is unadulterated as it goes out. So crucial. Then Paul says this in verse 11, For you know how like a father with his children. Oh, do you see this? We're changing now. We were with a mother uh, nursing her baby. Now we're like a father with his children. Well, what's a father going to do? A father is very important in the life of a child. In fact, many people don't think they need both parents in modern times. But God designed the family for a specific purpose. And a mother and a father are both absolutely critical to the well-being of the children. The father sets the godly example. Not that the mother doesn't, but you know what? The father is the one who, if he is following Christ and doing what God has called him to do, he is the one that will impact the children through his example. He will be that one they will respect instead of if he's not living well, that ungodly example uh, that gets rejected because of the hypocrisy of the father's life. Now, he says, like, when I was with you, yeah, I was like a mother, deeply desirous, affectionate towards you, but I was also like a father. Watch this. We exhorted each of you, and we encouraged you, and we charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Look at this. We exhorted you. What does that mean? That means we told you when you were wrong. We helped you understand the difference between right and wrong. We told you to move in a direction that would honor God, not in your own direction. We were there to press you to say you have to change. You have to be willing to live in a way that honors God. We exhorted each of you, each one of you, individually. Do you get that? I mean... He was involved. No father's a good father if he doesn't care for all his children, right? He cares for everyone. What's the greatest thing a father can, can see in his heart is, is to see his children living a godly example, living in faith with Jesus Christ, in relationship with him. Uh, a father is so blessed to be able to know that his children are walking in the light as Christ is in the light. Paul says, look, we exhorted you. We told you. Even if you didn't want to hear it, we told you. Okay? And we encouraged you. What does that mean? Hey, please come this way. Life is over here. Will you come? They were greatly encouraged. You're, this is like Remember when, you know, I don't know if you, your dad ever taught you to ride a bike, but my dad taught me to ride a bike, and, you know, he was so gentle, and but yet he was still, okay, you still need to get up on there. You might be scared. It might not feel good at first, but this is how you learn. I'm going to be here for you. Get up there and ride. You know, let me hold you up for a while, but then I'm going to let go. I'm going to let you ride yourself. All right, same ideas here. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to demonstrate the truth through my own action. And then I'm going to encourage you to come along. You start doing it. You start living well. You start being a minister. You start caring for others. You start proclaiming the truth to others. We encouraged you. We encouraged you. And we charged you. Again, this is very fatherly. Hey, you're off base. Hey, you're going the wrong way. Hey, let me charge you. This is the way. Charge not meaning like a credit card, like you owe me. No, but charge meaning like a command. Here's what you need to do, right? 
And what was the charge? Here it is, to walk in a manner worthy of God. Live by the truth. Submit yourself to the word of God. Follow Jesus. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow him. That's the point. Another thing we see here is Paul's message was right on. He, he loved them like a mother would love them, but he treated them like a father would treat them. When you minister to people, there's both sides of this. You want to care for them and desire, desire them affectionately, as Paul just told us. But you also want to say, but wait a minute. I, I'm, not, I'm not loving you so unconditionally that I won't tell you what the truth is. Here's the truth. Here's God's standard. Here's how you need to evaluate your life to walk with what God is telling you. Walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Well, church, I know that I've been a little long-winded tonight, but I, I hope you can understand this from God's perspective. God's telling you something here. You're a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, you might not have a formal degree and they might not call you pastor, but yet the people in your life depend on you to show them what it's like to know Jesus Christ, to show them what it's like to be loved by God. We are all in that position where God wants to use us in these ways. How do you approach the people in your life? We have so much to learn about how to care as parents for the people in our lives, that we would come to them, loving them affectionately, caring for them so deeply, well beyond a casual encounter. It's personal. We're involved. We're serving. We're giving our very selves. But as well, like a father, we're willing to say, hey, don't go that way. Let me exhort you. Let me encourage you. Let me charge you with what following Jesus Christ actually means. I pray that you get that and then as you face the people in your life in the next day or two, ask God to show you what's really in your heart toward them. Ask God to show you, is your life really the witness it's called to be in terms of your own behavior, your own language, how you live? Will you attract people to Jesus Christ or will they be able to label you as a hypocrite and dismiss Christianity because of how you live? I, I sometimes get tempted in people's lives. They're living very badly and they'll tell me, oh, well, I'm a Christian. I sometimes want to say, don't tell anybody that. Don't hold yourself up to be a follower of Christ and then walk off the set here and do whatever you decide to do. No, if you're a follower of Christ, you're governed by what Christ has taught us to obey. Very critical for us to examine our own lives. Anyway, church, I pray that you get this tonight, and I pray that as you move forward to help other people, as you serve God in the power of his Spirit, you treat them as we've learned to treat them tonight. God bless you. Serve him well.